It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Kevin Rowling, who is the editor of the AJC. Kevin has served in his current role since January 2011, but he has had a long, illustrious career with the AJC's parent company, Cox Enterprises. He began his uh, career with Cox back in Dayton when he was working with the Dayton Daily News, and he was a student at the University of Dayton, and that was back in 1983. And before making Atlanta his home in 2011, Kevin held many roles for Cox Enterprises in Ohio. He served as editor-in-chief of Cox's four daily newspapers and publisher of the Springfield, Sun's News, Springfield News Sun, as well as the general manager for Cox's online operations. Uh, Kevin has overseen the rejuvenation of the AJC and helped refocus the paper's uh, emphasis on investigative reporting as well as in increased coverage in the metro area counties. He understands the complex challenges that are faced uh, with traditional news outlets um, in the digital age and is also an advocate for innovative content to engage readers. Uh, in addition, he writes a weekly column for the AJC. Under his leadership, the AGC has obtained several notable accolades, and two of those include winner of the 2012 Hillman Prize for newspaper journalism, as well as being a finalist for the 2013 Goldsmith Investigative Reporting Award, which is awarded by Harvard University. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Rowling. Thank you. Thank you, and, and good morning. Uh, and I really appreciate the chance to be here. Um, so I'm going to try to do a couple things this morning, uh, including giving you a really sort of insider look at what we're doing at the AJC in the hopes that, you know, you'll have some lessons to take home to where you work uh, around digital disruption and what you do when you're, you're put in that position, because I think we all face that. I don't talk to anybody whose business is easy right now, and uh, we certainly had our share of it. And then also, I'm, I'm really hoping we can have a conversation. Uh, so um, here's the deal. Uh, if you interrupt me with a question, you get some AJC swag. We've got, these are like phone chargers or something like that. If you ask a question during the Q&A period, you get nothing, OK? <laughs> so that way, I think we can kind of keep it going, keep people from falling asleep. Um, of course, I, like any good speaker, I have dozens and dozens of slides. Here's the first of 25 just about me that we'll work our way through. No, all this was covered in the introduction, so don't worry about that. But what I'm really going to do is um, look at things this way, and, is, uh, and I hope the uh, lessons that we've learned and, and some of what I have to say about the AJC will interest you both, again, as business lessons, but also as an important member of this community and this state, and um, its leading newspaper playing an important part in how this state, state is shaped and has been shaped in its future. So uh, this is the agenda, and I always like to, I don't do this very often, but with, with really good groups, I start with a couple slides that I think really capture what's going on in our industry. Now, one small disclaimer, whenever I share uh, financial data or anything like that, it is, it's industry data. I know some of you may be uh, tweeting or posting things on Facebook or Instagram or something. Because um, I work for Cox, we're a privately held company, we really don't share our in-house data. So what you see will be industry data. I've had that happen where someone's tweeted something about Cox and it's been a big mess. And I've hung on to my job anyway, but I'd rather not deal with that. So, so a couple things about this industry we're in. And, and here's a really important one. This is the advertising revenue, which is the lifeblood of our business since 1950 until 2012. I can't seem to get the 2013 figures out of the Newspaper Association of America. They must just be too depressing <coughs> for them to compile or something like that. But, but what I would point out to you is if you look roughly about 2006, six seven, you see that it peaked as an industry at $50 billion. And really, six or seven years later, it was half that. So think about your business. And some of you have probably gone through this. Certainly, if there are any people in commercial real estate, they could tell this story. Um, what would happen if in about a five-year, five, six-year period, you had half the revenue that you had? And the, the incredible change and the way you have to react to that. That's part of what we're going through and what we're dealing with. Now, one of the, the confusing things about it is that 
people will attribute some of the challenges of the newspaper industry to a lack of interest in news, to a loss of news consumers, all that. Some of that's true, but it's mostly not. What it really comes down to is advertisers having lots and lots and lots of new options. And so in a business that used to enjoy a fair, a huge market share in advertising, we now face a world where we don't. And a really good example of that for us is automotive advertising. So there are people in this room who look old enough to remember when you would look for a car in the newspaper, right? If you were buying or selling a car, you would run a classified ad in the newspaper, and it really, really worked, you know? I mean, you'd have to worry a little bit about the people who might show up at your house if you're trying to sell, but for the most part, it really worked. You remember, anyone remember those days, right? So what happens now? Autotrader.com, right? Which we own, which we're happy about, you know? <laughs> which we in the newspapers like to think we really helped that business, and we remind our colleagues at Autotrader.com of that all the time. Now, we still get a fair amount of automotive advertising because we're still a great place to bring people into showrooms, to do stuff digitally, but it's a business that's really, really changed for us. And that used to be a huge and profitable category of business for us. Okay, so here's another one. I, uh, I like to remind people of this. The newspaper economic model, now I know what you're thinking. Newspapers are about the stories we write, and you know, there are all these things. Try to think of it this way. We're actually, historically, a massive manufacturing and logistics operation. We bring millions of discrete physical products to individual addresses every month. And we do that, really, we deliver that, that piece for around 50 cents. So look at this. The only other person who the only other business that comes close is the post office. They charge a penny less, they take a day off, and they're losing billions of dollars. You know, I mean, it's a tough, tough model. That was our business model. And it really, really worked for a long time. But in this day and age, it has really changed. And if you look at what other people charge you to bring something to your house, it, it's a very different, very different model. So those two things, advertising and circulation, our sources of revenue have really changed the game for us. And here's one of my favorite. Now, my friend Earl Davis is amazed by this, as you can see uh, from the photo. But um, <laughs> we are actually charge you less for the paper when we bring it to your house. Then, we make, then when we make you go buy it yourself. I mean, think about that for a second. It's amazing. The other thing I like to do is some of you probably paid more for a cup of coffee on your way here today than we would charge you for a whole week. I, I like to point this one out. I'm almost sure we'll bring you the paper for close to two weeks for a white mocha, white chocolate mocha venti, whatever they, I don't really drink that stuff. But So we're up against that, but if we raise those delivery prices even slightly are subscription prices. I mean, you should see my email inbox. People really, so we've got this value equation question that we're working with. So that is the part of newspaper that I would want you to understand. The other thing I like to tell people, this is a little bit old, but we'll bring you the paper for a week for less than a gallon of gas, what a gallon of gas costs. I mean, think about that for a second, how amazing that is. So one of the things we're gonna, we're looking to change in, Remains to be seen where, whether we can change is this. So really what we charged you to deliver the paper in the end was sort of a loss leader, depending on how a newspaper managed it, right? Because the advertising was so valuable, there was so much of it to bring that advertising to a household, still very valuable. That's why that Sunday paper is still so thick because it is those inserts that people like Home Depot and Walmart and Macy's put in there, that is incredibly popular and unbelievably effective, even still. Because people, as one of my friends, a, a woman who's editor of one of our papers says, you know what, the great thing about the Sunday paper is it gives you an excuse to go shopping. Because you pull the insorts out and you're like, hey, I gotta go here, look at this, you know? And so, but, but a lot of that's changing. And we're gonna have to figure out how to charge people more to actually get the paper because the advertising support will never be again as strong as it has been. So we're in this big transition to digital as so many of our businesses are. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know, how we're doing that, what we're doing, what's good, what's bad, what's ugly about that. So 
Again, you guys. <coughs> Is anyone going to interrupt me? Keith, I can't believe you haven't shouted a question yet. OK, all right, good. <laughs> Try not to misspell anything. <laughs> so a little bit about, about where we're heading uh, digitally. Um, a cartoon by my old friend Mike Peters, one of our, one of our cartoonists in one of our papers. So within all of this commotion, and I, I do think it's important for all of us to realize this no matter what business we're in, right? There's a lot of opportunity out there in the digital world. It just looks different, and it's disruptive and all that stuff. But for us, we actually have a chance to reach, reach many, many more people. And we still have, we're still the AJC. And what we do and say matters a lot in this state. And then there are, of course, the, the tough parts of this, right? That, you know, we're, we used to just be able to put the paper out, throw it on your, your you know, driveway every morning, and we were fine. You know? So the way our newsroom worked is, you know, you, reporters would come in 10 o'clock in the morning-ish, if we could get them there, kind of work on stories, you know, kind of about 6.30, finish their story, go home, get in the paper the next morning, we were fine. Now we are 24-7 all the time. We have our first um, actual formal news meeting at 8 in the morning, and we used to do that at 10 in the morning in the morning, and when I started this business, we never had a news meeting until about 3 in the afternoon, because we didn't have to worry about it, right? So that's Keith, who used to be a member of our staff. I don't know if you could make it anymore. That's way too early for a guy like you, right? I'm <laughs> and then another great thing about this that I always remind people of, this is one of our favorite ads, and our ad VP, uh, our marketing VP, Amy Chown, is here. She knows I love this ad, too. I mean, we can. People can get us anywhere, anytime wherever they are. And we have a lot of customers now. You know, we used to stop your paper on vacation and create this incredible accounting problem where you didn't pay for that, you know, all that stuff. And now we have people with their iPads who can take paper on vacation, and we know that's very popular for them. Uh, we have a lot of other ways to reach people. This is an example. We send an email to our subscribers every afternoon. I hope some of you get it. If you don't, you should sign up for it because it's, very, again, very popular where you can kind of catch up on the news of the day. And there's a great hunger for that. We send one in the morning, we send one in the afternoon. People now want us to send one at noon because it's, I don't know who's working. Everyone apparently is just reading our emails, but that's fine with us, so. So a little bit about how we got here and um, some of what we faced in the, in the, on the way. So again, any questions? Anybody have you gonna let me go on? All right, I'm, here, you get one of these, so. In this room, well, this looks like a very well-educated, highly intelligent <laughs> crowd uh, who cares deeply about being well-informed in their community. So I would guess it's pretty high, but I'm not going to ask. What we know, <laughs> what we know, though, is that our audience, particularly in print, is better educated, wealthier, and I'm sorry, everybody, older than the typical typical people in the market. What we care about is that they engage with us at all. You know? So I'll, I'll be honest with you, the perfect economic model in some ways, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, Amy, but I will. Um, so half of our costs are in printing and delivering the paper. right? So if I could convince all of you to get it every day and read it on your iPad and let us bring it to your house on Sunday, that'd be perfect for us. because. Then we're getting rid of lots of costs, but we still have all that engagement, all that opportunity, lots of things to talk to our advertisers about. The problem we have is there's some, there is a, I wouldn't say a problem, but the challenge is that we have different segments, right? Some people are totally digital, that's all they want to do. They never read anything that's not on their phone. I mean, you know the type. Some people are a mix of, you know, they, they want to use it. They get the print paper, they like to use their computer at work, they might use their phone in the evening or their iPad in front of the TV. And then we have some hardcore people, and we know this because whenever we do research, one of the things that happens, right, is people will say like, things like, all right, well, I'll answer your questions, but you're not quit, gonna quit bringing me the paper if I do, are you, you know? I mean, and I get a lot of letters like that, that you know, keep bringing my paper, so that's really, uh, and it, I think all that's good because people care about what we do, and people, and there are some real differences with people's ages, which we can get into, depending on, you, know, you hear all this millennial stuff and baby boomer stuff, and you know, and how people think about consuming news is very different. <coughs> is what we're learning. So, 
Anything else? Yeah. All right. So the question is how much of our content is available free versus a subscription, and in your case, particularly the Braves. So where we are was we, it, we, we try to separate it this way. If it's something that is um, you know, widely available anyway, we really don't put that, you know, make that available only to subscribers because you know, if you're going to read a game story about the Braves, you can read ours. You could probably read a lot of other sources. And then the things we do, what we really like to do is treat our subscribers really well. So it's less a mindset of let's deprive these non-subscribers and more a mindset of let's know what the non-subscribers are most interested in, but let's, with our subscribers, really treat them like they're sitting in first class. Make sure that they get really great stuff and that it's just a wonderful experience to be a subscriber. Over time, you know, we're working with that strategy. I'll talk a little bit about it. And, and we'll see how it works. So, okay, I'll keep going here. So, again, in all the commotion, this is something that I think applies to every business, certainly applies to us, is don't forget who you are. You know, it, it, marketing online, marketing in Flipboard, I mean, wherever you, whatever's going on, Facebook, Twitter, you know, you are a brand. And you should always remember that and understand what you have and, and, and what people want from you and, and how to get it to them. So that's been a big part of what we've done, and we've done that through these, through these three things. So um, one of the things our research, which we you know, work on all the time and um, do all the time about our audience, is we kind of step back <clears throat> and ask them, why do, you, why do you read the paper? What do you want? And, the, and, and these are the reasons that they they read the AJC. It, and it's really important for us to keep that in front of our, our staff and to remember that. Because as I tell our newsroom, look, there's a lot of commotion out there about which devices. I mean, there's even a mindset now that apps are dead, that apps are not the future. You know, there's all this stuff going on. But in the end, great journalism, great storytelling, and paying attention to this should keep us in the game. Let's let people figure out, let society decide how they want to get their information. Without this, none of that will matter. And so that's what we try to focus on. Yes. All right. Another, another gift. Go ahead. OK. <laughs> you I can't hear you, so I'm oh, coming over to hear you. you, you all yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a story I saw online the other day where one of you guys was predicting Texas was going to knock your prize and you were going to go to the Seriously, how do you guys handle that and, and still maintain independence with the real story out there? Yeah, I mean, the question about media bias, uh, which is a huge, huge question, and um, so there's a cu couple thoughts. We pay great a great deal of attention to it. With the tech UGA thing is yeah that we can't solve that problem. Um, <laughs> but uh, that said, um, particularly with political stuff, so we've actually spent a lot of time on our opinion pages and you know other, Kyle Wingfield, you know, one of our columnists, UGA grad, uh, is here, and we've spent a whole bunch of time doing things uh, along those lines. Now. And it's been very successful because we research it. We know how people feel. Um, there are some people whose minds are never going to change on either side, right? We know that. And then the other thing I remind people of, there's an entire industry out there, talk radio, whose whole purpose is to convince the world everyone's biased but them. And then it goes further into network television depending on what side you're on. So what we do, and if you've seen our opinion pages, you'll notice this, is we literally split the page in half, left and right, you know, do all that. And I can tell you that that's had impact. 
I can also tell you that before we did that, we used to run an equal amount of conservative and liberal commentary, but people didn't believe it. It wasn't until we actually created that visual representation that we started making some progress. It's really important, because we know this from our research, that people see us as in the middle, as an arbiter of truth. And what we know is when people sit down with their newspaper, especially on complicated things, like you know, pick your hot topic, Obamacare, you know, all this different stuff, they come to the newspaper to make sense of it all. Because, I mean, think about it, especially during election season. You, know, you get in the car in the morning, you turn on your radio, people are yelling at you, you watch TV, they're yelling at you, you got Facebook, I mean, all this stuff's going on. When you decide, I gotta figure this out. I need to know where I stand. That's when people come to the newspaper and they count on us to be able to do it. So it's really important. Great question. So. And you guys play a tougher schedule, right? That's really the reason. <laughs> yes. Actually, look at my swagger for Adam. Yeah. <laughs> you may not like what I say. Um, I'm sorry. Um, getting back to being a watchdog. Um, and again, I'm just, this is just trying to give you. Yeah, cut feedback. loose, man. I'm used to hard questions. Don't hold back. You know, I read the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Okay. And I read your business paper. And I feel like we're talking about two different cities. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. No, I appreciate the question. Man. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to. So I, you know, I, you know, I'd love to hear your comments. I want to hear when the Kia thing opened, right? Okay. <laughs> Let's start. No, I'm kidding. Um, so a couple things. Uh, the first and most important thing is we I, I, people don't believe this, but it is true. It's a little bit hard to to explain. But as journalists, we don't really think about whether it's positive or negative. We think about news. We think about stories that need to be told and we believe should be told and that we have to tell. So we don't necessarily you know, s like think, oh, well, let's go negative on the Kia plan or let's go positive on this. Um, so there's that. Without talking about the Business Chronicle's mission and what drives their economics and all that for a second, um, the watchdog thing is, is important to us, particularly as it pertains to taxpayers. People really want to know where their tax money is being spent. So. A better example for me that I can talk about because because I, I have been living this is the Brave Stadium thing. So we're kind of caught in this dilemma, right? Which is, um, depending on where you live and your point of view, your Braves moving to Cobb County can be good or bad, right? Some people think it's great. Some people think it's terrible. Some people hate the Braves for doing it. Some people love the Braves for doing it. We don't care. We've actually stated that explicitly on our opinion pages. We have no point of view on where the Braves are and see them as a business that ought to be able to do what they want, where they want, how they want, right? But where we do step in is Cobb County and the taxpayers, what it will cost the taxpayers, the deals and all that stuff. So we have people who are like, keep going. We want this deal to be very public. We want it to be understood. We want it to be in the clear light of day, everybody knowing what the county's agreed to. Then we have other people, including the Braves, who were out there saying, oh, the paper's just against this, they're just picking on us, they're beating us up, they're negative, and all that stuff. So I don't quite know like, what the answer is except to say, we believe that if important issues are put in the clear light of day, and that if our community understands them, in the end we'll be a better place. You know, it was, it, is what's going on in Cobb County the right thing or the wrong thing? I mean, who knows? But I think it's, Unassailable an unassailable argument to say Cobb County taxpayers deserve to know. Does that make sense in terms of that's how we would think about it? So, 
So, you know, again, it, it, I'll go through this research stuff quickly, but this is where, this is really the actions, these are the, really the actions that we took um, after the research. One really good way for us to find out what people think the most important things we should be doing is to ask them what they think belongs on the front page. So this is the list. And I always tell groups this um, because, I mean, many of you may be in the position of trying to get us to do a story, you know, something's going on with your business, you want us to do a story, you're on some board, you're trying to raise money, there's all kinds of reasons that people might want a story. Well, this is what our readers care most about. This is what we have to address, yes. This is my last piece of slide, so I pass that back over. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you this quick story um, uh, to illustrate the dilemma. And the, the short answer is I don't know really how to deal with that. Um, it's a really personal one. Later in this thing, if we have time, I'm going to show you a, a story that I did uh, where, um, about a veteran, a, a really deep story about a veteran and his wife. And uh, it involved going to France for a week with her and all this stuff, World War II veteran. So um, I was really proud of the story. In the end, I worked on it for many months, and we spent a lot of money on it. And so when we, we put it, uh, we made it available online. It was going in the Sunday paper. What we typically do with those big stories is they become available online Friday. And the window when people really, really view them, look at them, interact with them is kind of through the weekend and through Monday. Well, it also happened to be the same weekend that they confirmed Bruce Jenner was going to have a sex change operation and that Bobby Christina Brown was found in that bathtub in Roswell. So we have this story the editor worked on for months, invested thousands of dollars in. We have Bruce Jenner, Us Magazine, confirms his sex change, and we have this tragedy with Bobby and Christina. It wasn't even close. If, I, if we were just going to care about page views, clicks, all that stuff, here's what we would do. Post three or four reporters outside Emory Hospital and, and write something, even if we were making it up, about Bobby Christina every five minutes, because the page views just went through the roof. So it, it isn't a new dilemma. I mean, the truth is, is in media, we've always had this. What do you, how much do you want to you know, sort of play to the audience to create interest, mass, you know, an economic model? And how much of it do you want to do your job and, and give people what we think is really important? Um, we're, we're always walking that line. And, um, you know, we worry about it a lot. Like, you know, Kim Kardashian's butt, you know? Do you want to do that, or do you want to do this? And um, we do know with our printed newspaper, our readers resent deeply um, voyeuristic kind of news on the front page. They do not want that, and they, they, it does not work. Now, online, you know, people behave differently. So it's it's a constant constant dilemma. Yeah. So we're talking a little bit about content. I want to switch switch a little bit and ask the question: How do you all view local competition compared to a sort of a national paper like Times, The Globe, and the Alcorn News, for example? Well, you know, the truth is, is we don't worry too much about other national papers at all. I mean, certainly a regional paper like Dallas or Boston or something. We don't. We we. We talk to them because they're, they're in the same situation we are, and we learn things from them. By the way, it costs twice as much to subscribe to the Boston Globe as the AJC. Just a note there, right, right Amy? Um, the national papers were more likely to work with them and to cut deals uh, to be able to use some of their content. We're in the midst of doing that right now with a couple national papers, and we'll probably introduce some things on our website, again, just to kind of give people a place where they can get lots of information. But newspapers are all in this together. If we have a problem, it's that we, it's hard, that we don't work well together. And so it's harder for advertisers to deal with us and everything. I, I, newspapers compete to a certain point, but you know, it's the regions and the local community of interest and stuff is pretty well defined. So we don't worry about it too much. OK, so I'm going to keep going here. How, many, how much time we have? Um, a real quick thing, in terms of watchdog reporting, we also have a lot of opportunities digitally. So this is a new thing we've done and we're, we're continuing to revise, but we call it the Legislative Navigator. Just really quick, it tracks the legislature 
incredibly closely, including handicapping, literally giving odds on bills, whether they'll pass when they're introduced. You can go find your legislature, find out who gave them money, what bills he's introduced. We have this thing called a batting average that shows like how many of the bills they introduce passes. They love this, by the way, um, the guys in the legislature. But that's, uh, again, something available to our subscribers. Uh, real quick, too, you guys have probably seen some of the TV and, and heard some of the radio commercials. We learned the hard way we need to talk to our customers. What a surprise, right? Um, we were very much seen when I got here as this big, sort of hard to connect with institution. And we have really, really tried to change that. And, uh, and it's effective, and we find that people really like us telling them what we're doing and why. Yes? The print core audience is older than you. I didn't say they're a bunch of old people dying off. <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm older than you think. <laughs> um, but my question is this in the digital world, you spend a lot of time defining you know, your two or three user profiles or target profiles and that's user journey. What are three new users or customers that might surprise us? In the, in the, the, I'll say a basic thing. We've actually got six personas we share with our staff, you know, on these people. They're real people who fit in. But here's, here's the news for you on that. Millennials, intensely interested in news and a really great group of people for us. This mythology that they don't care about news, that they're not engaged in, just not true. They are news consumers. They care about it a lot. We think we have a tremendous opportunity there and we're taking advantage of it. It's, it's, that's the can't give you any more secrets than that. But okay. Yes? I noticed in my, folks in my generation, they don't... So he's out. positioning himself as younger than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, millennials, they don't, I won't name names, but there's lots of my friends, they don't take the time to find a cover story. I mean, clearly they, they see you as, I mean, I look at you more as a cover source, but you got like tons of stuff floating around in social media that you read it, you're like, Well, yeah, so let me, uh, without beating up millennials, because um, that concern, I have my children, obviously, are millennials, but um, here's, here's the generational difference. It's a little oversimplified, but let me, let me give it to you this way. If you're like my age, what you do is you actively consume news. You get up in the morning, you read the paper, it's like a completion experience is sometimes what we'll refer to it as. And I'm sure there are people in this room who like, I mean, I had to leave without reading the paper today because you people meet so early. And so I'm like a little off. I'm a little like not myself, right? And others probably know that feeling. Millennials kind of live in a world where they dip into the news stream during the day and when it's convenient. And they feel like if it's important, they'll find out about it. Their friends will tell them. They'll find out on you know, where, whatever social media they use. It's a, so I don't, know that, I don't know that I entirely would say they, they have no sense of credible sources. It's just a different way. Does that make sense of looking at it? I mean, I know people get up, read the AJC, they read the New York Times, and they read the Wall Street Journal before they do anything, you know? And if you, like when I, my daughter graduated from the University of Dayton about a month and a half ago. And when I got there the day before graduation, we were kind of getting ready for everything. Uh, she lived in a house with four other girls. And the, one, one of them was a business major, and as part of the deal there, they get the Wall Street Journal. Which, you know, I thought, God, that's pretty smart. The Wall Street Journal just sold a bunch of subscriptions. But there were like 25 papers piled up on their porch. And I'm like, Erin, you gotta like read these things. She's like, oh, I read it online, you know, so, but, so it's just a different, a different mindset, and we don't get to change them, right? We only get to adapt to them, and that's what we're doing, so. All right, I'm gonna keep going. You know, the other thing, too, is I like to say a few words about advertising, because we are a very, very powerful advertising vehicle in print and online still, and the most important thing to me as the editor of the paper is I recognize that anyone who advertises with us is part of something bigger than just marketing themselves. You know, what we do at the newspaper, how we do it is really important. We, f we care about it deeply. 
And anyone who spends their money with us is supporting us in doing that. And we're not, you know, easy even on our advertisers. I mean, Tom Scribner, who's one of our ad folks, can I talk about the Grady thing? Do you care? Okay. So on Sunday, you might have noticed we had a front page story about uh, Grady Hospital. Um, they've got, uh, you know, when, when someone comes into an emergency room after they've been raped, they have this whole process and these kits and law enforcement requires this. Grady apparently has a bunch of those in storage and has never really reported. There's, there's some confusion about, about that. It's controversial, as you might imagine. We run that story on the front page. They are a huge advertiser, and they have a huge ad on the cover of the metro section. You know what I mean? I mean, so that's an institution that see that that you have to look at and say, wow, you know, they really they care about the greater good. They will weather, you know, they will be held accountable. They will be transparent, and they don't like cancel their advertising and throw a fit because we did a negative story on them. Well. I admire that, and I admire the people and respect the people who advertise with us because it's about something more than just marketing your product. It's about being part of a, a bigger, a bigger thing in Metro Atlanta. So, so uh, people love this. I usually try to leave this out of the presentation, but it goes over well. So we do all this research, all right? And I know you're analyzing it. Relax. It's not that complicated. Um, <laughs> When we do research, and we try to do it every couple months or even more often, we ask this basic question. In the past six months, has the newspaper gotten better, gotten worse, or stayed the same? Then we take the number of people who say it's gotten better, and from that we subtract the number of people who say it's gotten worse. And what you really, really hope is that you have this momentum, as we call it our momentum score, that more people think it's getting better than worse. So we had some dark days. Kevin came. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And then, uh, and so we've been able to keep it positive. Some of the variances and, and, and stuff that's gone down, we're actually having a little trouble explaining. July seems to be a bad month for our readers. I'm not sure why. But we, you know, we think we, we have a good trend there. We're going to extend this, this look to across all digital and all of our other products, and we're not sure. But we have some very hardcore information that the things we've done work. And that was, in a newsroom, that's a very important thing. Reporters can be skeptical. Well, I'll just leave it at that. So it helps to have this stuff. So one of the other things I want to do really quickly, and I'll go through this fast, but the, the thing we know and we, we remember is that we have to do this. That, that it is, and I'll go through a very familiar scenario with you that that's the role we play in this community. So you might remember this. What you're going to see is our front pages in, in order. The governor loves this picture. He loved us for putting it on the front page, as you might imagine. And then his tweet uh, about the mayor. They were kind of at this little event as the storm was happening. So this was pretty rough stuff. And about two weeks later, we, we had it again. And you, you might remember this, you know. I mean, we just, I don't know how else to put it, we just kind of kicked Governor Deal's ass. And I mean, they were so pissed about what we were doing. And, you know, I didn't, what was I, I mean, I'd be interested in your opinion, but what did they expect? I mean, I, I you know, the public was furious. And, and one of the things I said, despite all, you know, there was some humor and all this eventually, we were one school bus sliding off a highway ramp away from a tragedy in that storm. And I think that's what's important to remember. So this time, you know, we stayed on in two. But here's what I would put in front of people. Because of what we did the first time, the second time, and even this earlier this year, things were a lot better. That's our job. That's what we have to do. You know, I got plenty of friends. It's okay if Mayor Reed and the governor are mad at me and won't take my calls. I mean, you know, that's just something we live with. But I would tell you that sometimes it's not that clear. It's not that easy. So this one's a little bit harder. And of course, because we, it's this one involves politics. There's some partisan overtones, so we can talk about that. So we did, we've done a lot of work on this ethics investigation involving the governor. And so I, I want to stop here and, and describe the situation. And, and let me start here. That's Governor Deal, of course. And the reporter in the background, Greg Bluestein, UGA grad, one of our best reporters, he covers the governor. 
governor, the chief executive of one of the most important states in the union, called a press conference to say this. And the guy who wrote the story was standing there when he said it. I shouldn't say wrote, worked on the story, I guess. Think about that for a second. You think about where you work, and if the governor called a press conference to crap all over your bank or you know wherever you work, how, what, what that would be like, you know, would that rattle you a little bit? Would it shake you up, you know? And then a few months later, the state paid two million dollars to settle these cases all together. So part of what we have to do is ask these questions, push hard, and stick with it. You know, we did that with the APS scandal. We've done that with some things. But it's hard. We don't want to be negative. We live here, success of the community. No, not, nothing affects our success more than the economic health of Metro Atlanta, by far. So we have, we have every interest in making sure the region succeeds. Absolutely. So. And this is really what we tell people in terms of paying attention to our brand, what we talk about in our newsroom, what, what is really at the core of what we do. Because we aren't about page views and clicks and circulation numbers and all those things. Those are all metrics. And you know, we, some of us were talking about this earlier. You know, we live in a world where everyone's got their metric and everyone's got their, um, you know, whatever, ROI. I mean, you know, it just goes on and on and on. But if you go to, you don't really go to work to get page views or clicks or you go to do something that matters. And that's really what I think it takes to succeed in, a middle, in the middle of all this digital disruption. Know what you're really doing. What are you really trying to do? Find that thing. This is what we are, we are trying to do. If you find that thing, you can work your way through the disruption. You know what I mean? But if you're, a, like in our case, if we're about throwing a newspaper, as many newspapers on your driveway as we possibly can every day to make lots and lots and lots of money, now well, we're in a little trouble then, aren't we? But if we're about this, we have an important place and a future and something we can really get up in the morning and care about. So, questions about that? Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, you know, we've been talking about that, okay, uh, and whether there are some things, sort of certain content areas where we could do that. Um, I would tell you that we really need to be successful in Atlanta and Georgia before we try anything like that when you really look hard at business, you know, the business models. But there are probably some, some possibilities going forward that we would look at. So, yes? For an inspiring journalist? Inspiring or aspiring? <laughs> I find aspiring journalists inspiring, just, just for the record. Um, you know, I get this question mostly from parents, just so you know, and I always say the same thing, which is this. There has never been more journalism going on than today. So there is a ton of opportunity out there if you care about being a journalist. Now, if what you care about is being, you know, a, a newspaper reporter or a local news anchor and stuff, you have to really evaluate where the trends are going in all those businesses and what the opportunities are. But journalism is, is core to our society, core to the United States. In fact, I think my, I mean, no, I'm not aware of a lot of other businesses that actually have a, in a, a part of the Constitution that 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 protects their business, right? So. I would say pursue it and find your way into it, care about it, and love it. I don't know anybody who's good at anything they don't love to do. So, yes? Well, here's what I always like to say about that. You know, uh, did you ever think about what Superman did for a living? Newspaper reporter. So I think reporters haven't changed a ton, but perception of reporters have, because you know they're not portrayed as Superman very often anymore. 
You know, mostly in, in, in popular culture, reporters kind of are this scumbag character in the movie that does something wrong, right? Um, but in the end, so there, there, there are some things that have never changed in my view and some things that have. The stuff that has, and any of the educators in journalism schools can tell you this, kids have to, you know, come out of school now. They gotta be able to shoot video. They gotta, I mean, they, they're like multimedia, you know, all kinds of different, different sourcing. And um, that can be a challenge because what you, you need more than that is this innate curiosity um, and, and just a persistence that's hard to find in people, you know? I mean, it is hard for Greg Bluestein to stand there while the governor says that stuff. That is, you know, that takes a special person to go back to the governor's office the next day and work on the next story. Um, when Bob Woodward and Bernstein came to Emory University, it was probably 18 months or so ago, and uh, Bob Woodward, you know, the famous Washington Post Watergate reporter, has this, this great story he told, and I'm not sure I'd tell it completely, you know, get all the details right, but every year he's a guest lecturer at Harvard in a journalism class. And he said he gives them this pre-work assignment, and the assignment is, how would Watergate be covered today? And he gets a lot of, well, I would go on the internet and I would Google Watergate, you know? And, you know, he makes the point that you, that's what reporters do. They go find those things that Google lets you search on. So, things, so that's, you know, some things have changed, but in the end, the core thing you need out of a reporter has not, or out of a journalist, so. All right, I, how much time do we have? Does anyone keep, oh, yeah. Um, so we don't have the same number of people. You saw the, you saw the revenue stuff up there earlier, and we, were, we fit well into that trend. I'll just leave it at that. So we don't have as big a staff. Proportionately, I would say that we probably devote a greater percentage of what we put in the paper is done by our own staff. But the paper doesn't have as many pages because it doesn't have as many advertising and stuff. But the, um, what we try to do through our research is determine what is what the most important things to cover are and then devote our staff to that and then use other sources for things that you know are not as high a priority or that we can get in another way I mean you know we run things like recipes and stuff you know making chocolate chip cookies in California is the same as making them in Georgia I think you know so we, we can use stuff like that um, but we try to devote our staff to stuff that could not be get, we could not do, or no one else could do any other way. So, by the way, UGA is our top sports thing, in case anyone was wondering, by far. So, I know the tech people never like to hear that, but it is true. If this were a tech room, I just wouldn't bring it up. So, um. <laughs> okay. So, really, something really quick that I just want to share. This is kind of a personal thing with me. Um, we have learned a lot about storytelling. And um, you, if you read the paper, you know about these personal journey stories that we, that we run every Sunday. Um, and this, this is always the funny part of the research. This is going to shock you. You do the all this research, all this work, and one of the things we find out, people who read our Sunday paper like to read. How about that, huh? How about that for an insight? I don't know. We paid a consultant a lot of money to find that out. But, and so, but, but what that means and what we learn is that they want a compelling, deeply touching reading experience in their Sunday paper. So that's how we landed on this. So what I want to talk about with this quickly is um, the editor, Kevin, actually did a couple of these stories and um, in, in 2014 published a story about a World War II veteran and um, it, it, the story was really about he did not, could not explain what happened to him in World War II. And, I worked on it for nine months. I would never let one of our reporters work on a story for nine months. I didn't work on it full time, okay? I'm just saying, it took me that long. And uh, ultimately, through a lot of work and research and sourcing, figured out what happened to the guy and wrote that story. Um, 
the following, I guess it was, yeah, the following March, he died. And I'd gotten pretty close to, to him and his family. And in the process of researching the story, I'd met veterans that had served in the same infantry division, the 95th Infantry Division. They fought in the Battle of Metz. And they had a nickname, the Iron Men of Metz. I've met all these guys. And they invited me to come to France for the 70th anniversary of the battle. And I really, really wanted to do it, decided to go. Well, his wife wanted to go. He had always refused to go to any of these military reunions and stuff. And so we went there together. And she kind of wanted to find out all this stuff. And we were able, through our research, to literally retrace his steps. There's a point in the story where we walk together on the very same road he walked on 70 years earlier, because it was the only road between these two towns. And we knew where his unit was and where they traveled that day based on our research. Now, I'm telling you all this because there's two reasons. The first is I want to show you something that demonstrates what a newspaper is now capable of and the opportunities we have in storytelling in this digital age, and it's a video that's available on our website. But I also want, I always do this with business people, there is tremendous power in stories. And when you are out there, I don't know if you're, you know, whether you're selling or persuading or managing a staff, again, we, we, we are really coached in a lot of ways to use data and information and metrics and all of that. But what really changes people, moves them, is a story. So we have really, really worked hard at our storytelling at the AJC because we know one really great story on an issue does much, much more than endless routine news stories will do. So what I'm going to try to do is play the video that we did on this. See if I can get to it. I've been assured that this will work, by the way, and I have never ever done a speech where the video works. So, see? Mark said he would be available to me. Did I, did I, I, I actually won $10 because we made a bet. <laughs> I said this never works, but this will only take a minute. The Lorraine American Cemetery and Memorial near Santevold, France, holds the largest number of American World War II graves of any site in Europe, more than 10,000. The cemetery contains hundreds of men from the 95th Division, 151 unknown soldiers, and 28 sets of brothers who are buried side by side. Eddie met a better fate than those buried here. There was a lot of, my cohort did survive. There was a lot of, of um, slaughter. But then when we got through, there was slaughter on both sides. About half of us being killed every day, I was being shot every day. So I was just wounded, not killed. But they were gone the next day. So, uh, Every day was a real achievement that you survived that one. And Shirley quietly spoke of his good fortune. It's very peaceful. And looking at these thousands and thousands of little crosses everywhere, it's overwhelming to think of that degree of humanity against a force that they didn't have to be against. And I, I, I think while it's beautiful and peaceful, quiet, very stately, all of those people had families at home, wondering about them, waiting for them. And that just multiplies the sacrifice. After the visit to the cemetery, Shirley headed to the spot that had been on her mind since she left Georgia, 
just over the German border, where Eddie's unit records say he was wounded on November 29, 1944. This was the ultimate goal and emotional summit of Shirley's trip. It looked as Eddie described it. Muddy farm fields, a chilling light rain, with barns, trees, and small towns in sight. He was climbing out of a ditch. Shrapnel struck him in the hand. Eddie's time in combat ended here in 1944. Death finally quit chasing him in this rolling farmland. He made it to Germany, and so did his wife, 70 years later. So we, we have come to what is really the final stop we wanted to make yes. as we retraced Eddie's steps while he was in combat in this part of the world. What does this make you think about him? I need to have a little souvenir from here. Do you think I could pick up a little rock or something and take it back home with me? And I don't see why not. Without getting too piggy. What is this? Oh, that. So why do you want to take it back? Well, it's uh, something that's concrete evidence that I picked up from the area where Eddie was wounded and where his time in war ended as far as battle was concerned. Okay. And, and then flown back to Thetford, England to recover. And so this rock will be the symbol of the end of our journey and significant as far as Eddie's journey is concerned. We made it. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> it's been long and hard, but not as hard, long and hard as his was, right? No, no, we had it a lot easier. Yeah. Thank you and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, there are two gifts that you've received today. So here's a sculpture that we provide to oh, all Tier Three Thursday speakers. And in addition, we will place a brick in your honor at our new business learning community in Athens. Oh, all right. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.